When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now they were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, they sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be. Think for a minute about first science projects the ones children prepare and learn from. The one that came to mind first for me involved seeds and soil and water, the one Robert Fulgham wrote about. Remember the little seed and the styrofoam cup? The roots go down and the plant goes up. Another science project children undertake is to watch a plain little caterpillar spin a cocoon about itself until it is completely shrouded within a chrysalis. The wonder of transformation is made real to the children when days later an entirely different creature, a beautiful butterfly, emerges from the apparent lifeless shell. As children, we immediately focus on the delicate creature that emerges so mysteriously from the cocoon. Since what happens inside the cocoon is unseen, there is a lot of romance about that cocoon. A creepy, crawly caterpillar is magically transformed into a radiant and soaring butterfly. Sounds wonderful and magical, doesn't it? Well, forget that thought. For the caterpillar, there was nothing wonderful or magical about it. A caterpillar doesn't just grow into a butterfly. A caterpillar must undergo molting and metamorphosis, the dramatic silence of the pupa in which the insect's morphology is entirely rearranged. How ironic that in today's vernacular, that word cocoon has come to mean exactly the opposite of what it means to a caterpillar. A cocoon isn't safe. A cocoon is where the caterpillar risks everything and where it enters total chaos, where it undergoes total rebuilding, where it dies to one way of locomotion and life and is born to a new way of living. A cocoon is where a caterpillar allows itself to disintegrate into a blob of gelatinous liquid without structure or identity so that it can emerge with sharpened sensory perceptions and breathtaking beauty. Only in taking the risk of entering that inert pupa can the caterpillar go from dormancy to potency, from ugliness to beauty. This is the reason why the butterfly is an authentic symbol of resurrection, not because it's beautiful, but because it risks dying to be born to new life. On that first Pentecost morning, the miracle of the Holy Spirit was not that of multilinguistic translations. The miracle of Pentecost was and is this. Pentecost power proclaims a fundamental transformation. The presence of Christ's Spirit burst out of accepted, established parameters. 
holiness became accessible to all, even those fearful disciples, and it was preached forth to all who would listen. Human attempts to keep the Holy Spirit contained in one holy language or one holy place failed that day. Christ's sacrifice split open the chrysalis and sent the Holy Spirit soaring out into the world. Who is it that gave the Church of Jesus Christ a safety-first, risk-free commission? Not Jesus. And who authorized the Church of Jesus to be a church of wimps? Not the Holy Spirit. There is no such thing as a risk-free life. Nothing is safe. According to the assurance, According to the insurance industry's publication, Risk Watch, safety is a word of primitive simplicity that has lost its utility in the face, not just of expanded technology, but of growing knowledge about the sometimes malignant complexities of nature. Safety first was not the motto of Jesus, nor of John Wesley, nor Phoebe Palmer, nor Georgia Harkness. Safety first is fatal to holiness. Cocoons are self-contained packets of risk. If that frumpy little caterpillar didn't take the ultimate risk of recreation, something which can be experienced only in the cocoon, he would never be able to break out as a butterfly. The way to the safety of a transformed life is found in risk. Too many of us are lured only by the idea of safety and we steer clear of risk. Do you know that even the US Supreme Court declared in 1980, safe does not mean risk-free. When my kids were little, they would get nervous about taking that first step onto a moving escalator. They would hesitate, halt, hover on that edge, reluctant to step on across the edge onto that moving piece. That first step is difficult and not just for kids, but once you take it, the movement of the escalator carries you along effortlessly. When a child or anyone else stops or does that stop and go thing on that edge, that first step, that's where the greatest danger is. We all, those of us behind them, all rear end one another, or topple over them. A child is safer taking the risk of getting onto something beyond their control than they are in holding back. The hardest part is that first step of faith. But from then on, it's easy. You cannot not be a risk taker. We have spent the last 14 months aware of the risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus. We have had safety and risk always in the forefront of our minds as we washed our hands, wore masks, sanitized surfaces, and kept our distance from one another. That risk is just beginning to subside, but there are a whole lot of other risks that maybe you haven't thought about in a while or maybe ever. You probably didn't think about it, but you took considerable risk just getting up this morning. Risks such as a one in two million chance of dying by falling out of bed a one in 350,000 chance of being electrocuted by your alarm clock. While brushing your teeth, you flirted with a 20% chance that our local water supply has infectious bacteria in it. You men endured a one in 7,000 chance of a serious injury while shaving. Men and women endured the danger of a one in 2,600 chance of being zippered, snapped, or buttoned into some sort of injury. We are lucky to have made it to worship. We survived the risks of getting out of bed and turning on our computer or television to worship online. 
The danger today lies with safety. The benefits lie with risk and speed. We must give up the church's safety-first, risk-free approach to ministry and mission. We need to embrace a more entrepreneurial, risk-taking, failure-embracing strategy. Can we support, or are we willing to support, the more imaginative and energetic self-starters, risk-takers in our midst? Social systems are not unlike biological systems. They work not so much by trial and error, but by trial and success. The disciples risked ridicule and retribution by proclaiming the gospel message out to that crowd in words they could all easily understand. They took a chance and believed that the authority and power of the Holy Spirit would work through their words. It was a profound risk, but that moment of proclamation brought into being the church as the new creation of God. There is no safety in safety. There is only safety in the risk and dare of a life of faith. Faith is but another word for risk. Take some time today and ponder that thought. Faith is another word for risk. God is the biggest risk taker of them all. Albert Einstein could not come to terms with his own theories because he said that God couldn't have built this kind of risk into the universe. God couldn't have created a universe with this kind of indeterminacy and unpredictability and chaos. God does not throw dice, Einstein said. Well, Einstein, you were wrong. And late in life, you came to see how wrong you were. God does take chances. God created you and me with the right of refusal. Right of refusal. We can take God or not. We can have faith in God or not. God built risk into the very heart of the universe. At an atomic level, at a cosmic level. God is big enough and bold enough to put the very being of the Godhead at risk by creating you and me. That doesn't mean that God is endangered by our right of refusal, but it does mean that God suffers because of our right of refusal. God created a cosmos where the creation can participate in God's own creativity. That also means that while you and I don't get safety, we do get joy and delight in the experience of the divine. We get the privilege of participating in the creativity of God. If we want transformation, we must risk the chaos of the chrysalis. Let's pray together. Oh God, I am grateful for each person uh, worshiping this day and grateful that they have not refused a life of faith or a life of belief, a life knowing you. And God, I am grateful for the reminder today that you didn't create us to just seek out and pursue being safe, but rather you created us uh, with the ability, the possibility of transformation and sharing that with others, a transformed life, a transformed world. So God, I pray that as we, as a church, consider the ways that you are asking us to take risks and to set um, what feels safe aside, to be adventurous, 
to just take that first step. So God, I don't know what that looks like exactly, but I know what that feels like. I've been in those places before. So I pray that you would help us to get comfortable with that risk, that daring to do something um, for the sake of our neighbor, for the sake of our life of faith, for the sake of the transformation of the world. And God, as your people gathered, we pray together. And we pray together a prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.